The Beluga is vital to the way that Airbus works. It's used to carry components from factories all over Europe to the final assembly lines in France and Germany. On average, this industrial powerhouse produces almost one airliner every day. It's a complex system that guarantees one strange fact. An Airbus jet has already flown thousands of miles before it ever takes off. But when it came to the A3XX, as it was still called, there was one huge problem. Few of the giant parts could fit inside the Beluga. In fact, the Beluga could uh, fit inside the A3XX. So we had to think of something completely different. Now a seemingly impossible task fell to this man, 51-year-old Spaniard, Jesus Morales. The team even studied carrying the wings piggyback style on another plane. But after wind tunnel tests, they decided the aerodynamics would be too risky. Y entonces nos concentramos ya en el transporte por superficie, que parecía más viable. Rápidamente pareció que la solución marítima está un puerto en el Atlántico. Jesús and his team devised a system that uses roads, rivers and the sea in a logistical dance that has to fit together perfectly and work first time. The fuselage, wings and tailplanes will set off by sea from the factories in Germany, Wales, France and Spain, converging on the port of Poyac on the west coast of France. From there, they'll be loaded onto barges that will carry them 59 miles up the river Garonne, and still the journey is not complete. A fleet of lorries will haul the parts by road, the last 152 miles, to Toulouse. Bob Burden is the man who has to coordinate the schedule. There will be many late nights ahead. Many of us are burning the midnight oil, very long days at the moment, and uh, life seems to exist around work at the moment. Airbus have commissioned a 22 million pound ship from China to carry the parts, but it won't be ready for the first transports. Instead, they've hired a general purpose cargo vessel to ship the first fuselage components from Hamburg. But even that is having problems. They've discovered a three-foot crack in the rudder and must repair it before the 30 tons of aeroplane can get underway. It's always the same. Whenever you have a new program, there are uh, obstacles to overcome. But at the moment, it's, uh, it's, it's stressful for all the people here because we're at the sharp end at the moment. The repairs stretch long into the night. As ever, the clock is ticking. Early the next morning, and the first finished fuselage sections of the biggest airliner the world has ever seen emerge into the light of day. The parts are carried on purpose-built, radio-controlled, self-powered low loaders. Each one has 96 wheels and can travel at a maximum speed of only 6 miles per hour. The factory is just a few hundred yards from the purpose-built dock where the cargo ship waits. Engineers finally finished welding the rudder at 3 o'clock the previous morning. And now is the time for these outsized parts to start their 970 mile journey by sea. They are going to have to make good speed if they are to recover the time lost to the delay. In Britain, another early start as another massive plant is about to release the components built within its cavernous interior. 
Gareth Williams is in charge of the operation. For him, today is a big day. After the last two months of preparation, the previous two years of planning, we've actually got the moment now when the wing's going. So it's an exciting time. It's what people here have looked for for many, many months. Stage one of this thousand mile trip is to get the wing from the factory to the nearby River Dee, where the giant piece will be loaded onto a barge. Again, a low loader is used, but this one is modified. It has to pass over a narrow railway bridge, and to prevent a collision, a special guide wire has been built into the road to ensure the low loader doesn't hit the bridge. As the low loader approaches, they're depending on the system to work. If all goes to plan, the clearance will be a matter of inches. The high-tech system works, and the next phase is to load the wing onto the barge. Now the dangerous tides on this treacherous stretch of river are their biggest headache. It's, uh, it's not to be messed with this river. The tide's important because downstream there are three low bridges, and beyond them lie constantly shifting sandbanks. Sail when the tide is too high, and the barge will hit the bridge. Wait for it to fall, and they could easily run aground. It's a real balancing act as to where you get off the off the blocks and get under the bridge. Graham Harwood, the barge captain, has been studying the river for the last four months. He's planning on clearing the first and lowest bridge by just 19 inches. We've got to have half a meter clearance under the bridges, so the timing is of the essence, like you now. Neither is this the best time of the month, with the current flowing particularly fast. They haven't picked the right time for us, because the tide is making probably about five knots. And, um, you know, we've got to compete with that later on. So, not, not the best time of year, not the best tide, for the first time it's been done. But I'm sure we'll manage it. We'll have to. At last, the wing is gently manoeuvred onto the barge and the low loader carefully retracted. It's time to put all the theory into practice. The crew constantly monitor the clearance under the bridge. As they approach, they realize the strong wind is holding the tide back. They might hit the bridge too soon. So Graham holds off for a few more seconds. Graham has judged it perfectly, cutting it fine under the bridges so he has plenty of water under his keel for the remaining 13 miles of river. Now he can rely on his knowledge of the river's channels and navigate to the transfer point where the cargo will be unloaded and put aboard another ship for the 630 mile voyage across the open sea to the west coast of France. So far so good. An incredibly complex transportation system appears to be functioning just as planned.